Yo, so a lot of people right now talking about this whole, you know, high value man, mm -hmm. how to get a high value man. And, you know, a high value man makes six figures okay. or more. And if you're not a high value man, you do not, uh, no, if you do not make six figures, you do not, and you are not a high value brother. Okay. And I assume that one should be concerned about high value status because that's what's going to attract women. Yeah, so for life. us single brothers, it's yeah. like, you know, if I wasn't making six figures, then I'm not considered a high value man. Okay. I'm considered a man. So first, I'm very thankful that I never uh, was taught that. Me too. Uh, earlier on in my I'll, life. Because I'll be pissed off. I'm going to be real. Yeah, because first of all, I never needed six figures. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, hey, hey I, I, I never needed six figures. That's the first thing. Real talk. Uh, the six figures is for me. Now, the six figures doesn't mean nothing. Right, but if I'm going to pursue six figures, I'm going to do that for me. Right, 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 right. right? I, I think if you're living your life in a way to where you're trying to figure out what you need to do to attract someone else into your life, I think you've already lost because you've misplaced where the prize is. The real prize to be sought in life is not the affection or approval of another person. God. The real prize to be sought is your own purpose and potential. And when you got that locked down, you ain't gotta worry about other people being attracted to you. That's God. high value. That's high value, yo! <laughs> Bro, I, listen man, I'll be on Clubhouse. I, 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 and I, and my team wants me to do a show in here and I'm like, ah, I just, I just, I don't know. Because I'm like, man, I know school teachers i know firemen i know police officers i know people who serve in the military who make fifty thousand sixty thousand dollars a year and they are high i wouldn't say high value these are just right. good solid quality men right you know and then let's not even go on the other side they say you know if you're not a good looking woman with a nice shape you're not a high value woman and for me i just can't even put a value on my queen on my best thing Sure, sure. Because God said, that's my best thing. There is no value I can put on that. Now, does she bring value? Does she help me out? Absolutely. But I, I don't know, man. Man, this, let me say one more thing about this. Six oh, feet. shoot. Because I love the idea of there being more young brothers out there today that want to be in a six-figure club. Absolutely. I love that idea. That's what, and you need to be rocking with me because that's, that's what I'm going to teach you how to do that. Right, right. But if you tell me you want to make six figures... Because there's some girl that you like. My question to you is going to be like, bro, but don't you want that for yourself? Dude. Like, like hold up. You Ooh. you don't want six figures for yourself. Yeah, yeah. But you're pushing to get into that club because she will like you? Yeah, yeah. Ugh. I want you to want it for yourself, man. Nah, man listen, bro. You've already lost, bro. And I, mean, I want you to want it for yourself. That's a problem with brothers today, man. Yeah. We, we associate success with money. I'll get a good woman if I make good money. Yeah. And that's not the case. I think if you are a good man, a solid man, a God-fearing man who, who can provide, who can protect, who can be the priest of his home, you will get a solid woman. And you do not, and it doesn't have to be with money. Now, let's be real. Do I want my brothers who rock with me, who follow me and my brand to make six figures? Heck yeah. I want you to make seven figures. Why? Not so you can have a woman. No, so you can see, so you, so you can leave wealth, so you can leave freedom, so you can leave peace and joy to your family. So you can give an alley hoop to your kids, 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 and set them up to succeed, not just to get married. That's it, man. Freedom began for me in the relationship arena when I made up my mind that whoever I'm going to be with, she is someone that my life is going to organically intersect with on the path to my purpose. Oof. I'm going to be walking the path that wears my name, uh -oh. and we're going to run into each other along that path. Uh-oh. So would you say yeah. you're a high-value man? What yeah, would you? Of course. Okay, and why would you say you're a high value man? I don't know what it means to not be a high value man. I'm dialed in. I'm doing what God created me to do. What, what's the alternative? Like, what would I need to do to not be high value? All right, all right. Is your wife a high value woman to you? Absolutely. I don't. I don't. I can't even imagine how our lives would have intersected if that were not true. Ooh, we. Is this a conversation I should do on my show? I think so. On being a high value man. What's going on, Dr. Thunder? What's happening, TK? It's good to see you, man. I'm ready for this conversation, man, because you always been a high value brother, man. Hitting the gym, walking around the dorm rooms back in the day. 
Command and respect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah so you know, the high value. Trying- yeah, the high value thing is an interesting concept. Uh, we know that uh, at least modern sort of uh, versions of this and the sort of resurgence of this kind of term uh, is due to uh, a lot of content that originated in the manosphere, in particular the black manosphere with one Kevin Samuels. And um, if you don't know who that is, um, you probably should know who he is and you'll either love him or you'll hate him, but he's stating facts. So let me, let me set this up because I want to give you a chance to go into that a little bit more to provide some context here. But for the framework of our discussion, the clip I just played was from a conversation on Anthony O'Neill's show, The Table. I encourage you to follow Anthony O'Neill on social media, subscribe to the show. He has a lot of really great conversations about financial freedom, entrepreneurship, and just making yourself better overall. Has a lot of really great guests overall, but also talks with a lot of uh, black financial educators and entrepreneurs too. So lots of great stuff there. And shout out to Anthony for having me on the show. I really enjoyed my conversation with that brother. By the way, one thing I just want to say about him, he is what I call a two-way podcaster. In sports, you have the concept of like the two-way player. In basketball, for instance, a two-way player is somebody that can play both ends of the floor really well. They can they can get you a bucket when you need somebody to score, but they can also shut down the best player on the opposing team when you need a critical stop. Kawhi Leonard, you know, great two-way player. And I think a two-way podcaster is somebody who can show up on somebody else's podcast as a guest and they can bring the heat. They can drop a lot of valuable knowledge for your audience. But then they can also turn around and interview someone else and celebrate that other person's story and insight as if they're hearing it for the first time. And I haven't seen anybody be a two-way podcaster like that guy. There are some people that are great when they're asking questions, but then maybe when they're in the hot seat, they don't really respond to that kind of pressure as well. And then there are some people that love being in the hot seat. They love giving their ideas, but then When it's time to ask someone else a question or let someone else shine, that can be a difficult thing for them to do. And Anthony just does both really brilliantly. You know, so you you see him hooping and hollering every time I say something. But that brother is genuinely excited about all of his guests. I mean, he, he brings people on his show and he gets really pumped up by the things they share. And I just think that's for a guy that is a great standalone speaker and educator. I think that's a commendable quality. All right. So this this part that I just aired wasn't on the show. It was it was recorded um, after the show. We were just having casual conversation. And he's been getting a lot of questions from his viewers on the concept of high value man. And what he was reading to me was something that one of his viewers shared. Neither one of us claimed that we spent hours of research on the topic high value man in preparation to do a whole show on that. We were just talking for a few minutes about something that an audience member asked. And so we were addressing the question as it was presented, you know, do do men need to make six figures in order to be high value? And it appeared that from the framework of how it was asked, it's about being more attractive to women and so on. But there were some comments that made it clear to me that this is a much bigger conversation that we were stepping into. And I'm going to lean on you to kind of set that part up. But I want to read some of the comments that people wrote. Some of them were maybe kind of be expected, expected, like just agreeable comments. Someone said, this was so on point. I'd like to add that women play a role as well. Too many women lead with he needs to make six figures when asked about what they want in a male. All right. Another says it depends. It depends on who's measuring the value because a man or woman can be considered high value because of their financial status, but have great value character. Uh, Another person said, my father did not make six figures, but he made sure we were protected, loved and taken care of. After he passed away, he made sure my mother was provided for it and all debts were paid in full. Then someone else writes, Kevin Samuels has entered the chat. (laughs) One person says, I think this is out of context. Every podcast that I've heard, speaking of the high value man, simply suggests that guys make six figures, are fit, never married, no children, etc. That simply speaks to marketability when it comes to choosing a mate. As for the female, if she makes or has money, is is fit, 
never married and has no children, those qualities make her more marketable. However, women's art and sought after to provide. So her money is nice to have, but isn't a factor when it comes to being chosen by men. We have to be honest and stop acting like each of us don't rank or size up people who we're considering when we're trying to choose. You may not use the term high value, but a scale or barometer of some sort is used. So on the surface, it seems like asking a question like, does a man need to make six figures to be high value? It seems like that's an obvious no, because we can all think of good people in some sense of the word good who don't make a lot of a lot of money, but they have great friends. They're happy with their lives. But there's clearly more to the conversation. So what I want to ask you so we can delve into it here is where did this concept come from? Why is this a conversation that's happening right now? And what does it mean to be a man of high value? Uh, yeah, so um, the high value concept has been around for a long time. Um, there's always been a small percentage of the uh, population uh, um, that have had a a disproportionate impact on society. Um, and I'm not talking about necessarily stars. Uh, I'm talking about folks that are, you know, uh, folks like uh, 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 Musk, you know, or uh, folks like, um, you know, uh, Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, folks that have had a disproportionate impact on society. And when you look at these, these folks, uh, you can make certain generalizations about uh, uh, the sort of prerequisites to that high value. Um, now, in this sense, there's something that is similar about uh, Malcolm Gladwell's um, outliers uh, in this uh, sort of 10,000 hours principle where uh, the amount of natural ability, there is a particular amount of natural ability necessary. I'm talking about Gladwell now. Um, uh, but having uh, unlimited natural ability is not necessary. You just have to have enough and then you need to uh, combine that with this 10,000 hours. And then that, that is the prerequisite for being able to have the sort of transformative impact that folks, uh, that, uh, he mentions, uh, in his book. Um, now understand that you could have all of these characteristics and still not necessarily be high value. Uh, because high value is going to be about how what it is that you're doing is actually impacting society, impacting at least your sector, you know. So, uh, so there's a few things that Kevin Samuels in particular talks about that don't get mentioned. Uh, they don't get mentioned. Everyone focuses on the money thing, the six figures thing, but they don't dig down deeper into more of the meat of what it is that he's saying. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to list a few of the things that he says. Well, there's six principles that he, that he says one. So yes. Thunder, before you go, the, before you go down that list under, before you go down that list, yeah. j j j just to make sure I'm understanding the whole idea of being a high value man is about the value assessments other people make of you, not about correct. self esteem. That's right. Okay. Right. And, an it's not, and it's also, yeah, yeah it, it's also not about, this is not a spiritual construct. You know, this is about uh, impact societally. This is about other people. Um, in fact, one of the, one of the points I was going to make is about other people that are high value, recognizing that you're high value and accepting you as part of that sort of group, you know, so there's a sign off, there's mm -hmm. prerequisites, you know, um, and, and no one is saying that if you don't qualify 
for being considered high value that you are of no value or that um, you don't still have the same, uh, you know, humanity. And so you can be someone that is just a good person, is grinding it out, whatever your income is, you're doing for your family, uh, you're, all of that stuff, and still be uh, a major asset in, 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 in doing the will of God for your life even, right? Meeting all of the uh, uh, goals that you're setting for yourself and not necessarily be considered high value, but that doesn't mean that you're of no value. And that it doesn't mean that, that there's, uh, there's a lack of importance. I think people start to get in their feelings because what happens is it's like, okay, well, you're talking about all this high value stuff, you know, well, what's, you know, how, how, you know, you're, you're, nobody's better than me. I'm just as good as anybody else is, you know, this kind of thing. And it's like, that's not really the point, you know, um, there always has been a sort of rating system to make decisions about who is wherever they are in this sort of, uh, uh, not just socioeconomically, but is, is terms as the, in, but in terms of the kinds of things that certain folks disproportionately can provide for society. I mean, you know, you know, people that like invented, you know, stuff like, you know, uh, the light bulb or, you know, uh, you know, the principles of electricity, you know, the guy that discovered that, or, you know, there's a, there's a long, there's a, you know, short list of things that there, these are things that we use, all of us use all the time. And had not that person done that, how would our lives be different? That's like the marker and definition of what it would be to be high value. You know, it's high value to society. It's, um, yeah. So here, so here are the things. So yeah, there is a 10 K per month, uh, sort of, uh, thing. And this is based on, as he says, Atlanta, Atlanta dollars. So if you live on the East coast or the West coast, when everything's like, you know, three or four times more then you would have to multiply three or four times more. So say if, um, if I'm making a hundred K in the Midwest, I live in Columbus, for instance, if I'm making hundred K into Columbus, then I'd probably need to be making like 400 K or 450 K or something like that. If I was living in New York city or if I was living out in LA or something. Um, another one is length of time of time having made that income. He says it's three to five years. So you can't just be, uh, so for instance, you can't hit the lotto and be, and be high, high value right? You can't, um, you just got a good job and now you're in the first year of doing that. That's not high value. I mean, you're in the beginning stages of that, but he says three to five years at that rate. He says group acceptance by other high value men, group acceptance. So other high value men look at you and they see in you (laughs) something that they consider to be similar to, to, uh, what it is that they are and they understand, you know, what, what this whole thing is. They've been there for a long time. And so their, uh, their view is important. Uh, a network of other high value men. So high value men, you know, the, the, the saying, uh, um, uh, birds of a feather flock together. So the tendency is going to be for high value men to travel in this, in similar circles. Right. It doesn't mean that the only people that, you know, are high value men, but it means that, you know, a lot of high value men. Um, and with that, it means that you can ask for things from the other folks in that network. You can connect people. Uh, someone that I frequently collaborate with, I would say, is is the very definition of a high value man. His name's Ike Ogiamian. And Ike owns a engineering firm. He also uh, is involved in sales, uh, where he sells um, uh, engineering equipment and uh, things. And then uh, on top of that, he is very generous 
Matter of fact, they call this cat Super Super Chat Jesus <laughs> because I remember when I found out about him, he was in on Kevin Samuel's show and he was given $500. Like every, it seemed like every night he was given like $500 Super Chats. Um and um, and he knows everybody. So if I needed if I need a connection with someone, I can co- contact him. I say, hey, man, you know, uh, you know, a matter of fact, he hooked me up with O'Shea. You know, just just to give you an idea. And uh, number five is visibility. So your career has to be a, as he says, a LinkedIn level kind of career, LinkedIn level Uh, position. So what that means is that you can't be selling sneakers out of your trunk of your car. You could be making that amount of money, but that's not, that's not high value, right? Um, uh, He's not talking about stuff like, uh, you know, I mean, you could, you could be a, you know, uh, acquiring your funds illegally. That's not, that's not high value. Okay. And he also does not uh, immediately consider people that are celebrities, you know, blue check mark folks, you know, celebrities, um, musicians. He does not necessarily put them into that category, although they, of course, would be making a certain amount of money and have been doing that for a certain period of time. It's not necessarily the case. The calculus is different. And then he says utility, and that's the usefulness to the group. So, you can't be, so one thing that he frequently says is you can't be a high value loaner. You cannot be a high value loaner. Can't be in the, in your basement. You're making a hundred K a year, you know, um, maybe you even know other high value men, but if you're not, uh, um, known by, uh, by folks, if you're not, um, interacting regularly with other high value men, and in society and being useful to the group, being useful to society, being generous, you know, um, uh, helping other people to create, you know, connections, you know, connecting folks with other folks. If you're not involved regularly with that kind of thing, then you're not high value. And so these are the, these are the principles. And notice that the only one that usually gets discussed is the six figure thing. But notice that there's a lot of meat on the bone that they're leaving (laughs) <laughs> by just talking about the six figure thing. So, yeah. I appreciate that breakdown. So one distinction I want to make, because I think this distinction may be something that captures what is being articulated with the high value, high value man concept. Um, I often make a distinction between uh, ontological value and economic value. Ontological value is the value of your beingness. How much are you as an individual worth in terms that cannot be limited to or measured by dollars, right? Um, A person who is on bed rest, a person who is in hospice, they have value, right? They, 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 They may not be able to command power in the world, but there is an intrinsic worth and dignity to human life. That's ontological value. We can, we can describe that in spiritual or religious terms. And what does God think of you? And what does God say about you? And how does God command or expect other human beings to treat you because of that? Economic value refers to your usefulness to other people as it pertains to solving problems or creating value as measured by other people's willingness to part with value in return for your value. And not all forms of value can be measured economically, but the economic factor is an important one to consider because there are things you will want in life that will be the direct result of your capacity to create economic value for others. And this always plays some role in your relationships. So if I am coaching someone who's 18, 19 years old, and they're getting ready to go to their first job interview, I want this person to know that they have as much value in the eyes of God as the CEO or COO that's going to be sitting across from them interviewing them for this job. That They don't need to go in there hanging their head low. They don't need to go in there apologizing for their existence. 
they need to go in there with a sense of self-worth, understanding that they have been made in the image and likeness of God. And when the story is said and done, they might be in a greater position of power than the person that's about to interview them. At the same time, if you want to be hired for this job, you have to do some thinking about what matters to this company. And it is not enough for you to walk into the interview feeling great about yourself, feeling like you deserve a paycheck for the feels, but you've got to ask yourself, how does this company define value? What matters to them? Right. And how can I take my skill set and my talents to use that in a way that makes positive things happen for their customers? And so it sounds to me like the high value concept is really a way of talking to people about exercising some social intelligence about the way other people size you up when you try to get them to cooperate with you or collaborate with you on any level, whether it be dating, business, friendship, you've got to understand that no one is going to peer into your soul and give you everything that you want, be your best friend or marry you because you are loved by God and have a high self-esteem. Their high self-esteem, they're going to be looking at you in terms of, hey, what difference will you make in my life? What value will you add to me? Whether that be in terms of your conversation, your network, your ability to provide and so forth. And, and I think that's a useful thing to educate people about because I do think that self-esteem culture can easily condition people to think that it is enough to make it in this world just by feeling good about yourself. And I, I think it's so important to think about value, not only in those terms, but also in terms of what matters to the people you want to cooperate with you. Yes. Yes. Okay. You've defined it. You've given some context. We've made some distinctions. But it turns out this is a very controversial idea. And there, there was a video that I watched the other day where someone, it was titled Exposing the Satanic High Value Movement. And there are a lot of people who identify as Christians that say, hey, this is bad stuff. This is bad stuff. This is not good. And there are a lot of people who hate or criticize Kevin Samuels. I know he claims to be a Christian, uh, and I know he is often misunderstood for saying that guys should be players. I, I, I know that he encourages marriage, but he just encourages people to think critically about it. But, but this is a controversial idea. I, I, I like for you to kind of break down why is this idea so controversial? And as a believer yourself, what, what is your response to the notion that being a high value man is um, is a low value concept? Yeah. So the first thing to say is that though Kevin is a Christian, Kevin says that the high value concept is not a Christian concept. And what he means by that is that it is not exclusive to Christianity. It certainly is, um, uh, it's not at odds. It's not at odds with Christian Christianity, but it is not a specific to Christian. So, so in other words, you could be a Christian and be high value. You could be a Buddhist and be high value. You could be an atheist and be high value. You could be agnostic. You could be a Muslim and be high value. You could be, um, uh, <laughs> you could be a, a a Republican and be high value. You could be a Democrat <laughs> and, and be high value. Um, so the uh, the concept is not doesn't necessarily belong in any particular category. It's something that seems to. Um, it belongs in a category. It just, it, you know, it's just not exclusive to any of those categories. Let's put it that way. Um, okay. So that's, that's the first thing. And so I think one thing that certain folks do, uh, you know, there's certain, you know, sort of flavors of Christianity that uh, will necessarily dismiss a concept because uh you know, because there could necessarily be someone that has a different faith tradition that is considered high up in that scale, right? So, so I think that there's some natural tension, or you know, pretty common tension there. 
I also think that uh, some folks think that it sort of glorifies uh, the dollar. You know, it's all about money. It's all about, again, they're focusing on that first thing that, you know, uh, uh, you know, because, you know, the Bible says that, you know, uh, it's it's easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right. And we know the story about um, the rich young ruler, you know, that he he gives up all of his money uh, so that he can, uh, you know, one day be saved, you know. Um, so uh, there is this idea that this sort of attachment to money in in uh, aggressively pursuing money, uh, you know, is is morally reprobate or, you know, at least anti-Christian. OK, uh, so I think that but I think. <laughs> I think that there's some maybe double uses of certain words that make it easy to sort of misinterpret what's 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 happening here. The love of money is the root of all e evil, not money itself. Money is very useful if you understand how to use money. Uh, but yeah, if you're putting either the acquisition of money or money itself as a as a sort of concept above everything else, then yeah, that's a, that's a root of all evil. Um, however, if you're using money as a tool, you're using money as a way to change society, as a way to uh, accomplish certain goals that without that money, you would not be able to accomplish, then, then, uh, you know, then there's no problem. Um, of course, Can there's a distinction between... Go ahead. Go ahead. It's it's really interesting how even 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 when you just take the love of money is the root of all evil, and and try to use the conventional understanding that people have of that to explain some of the evil that we see every day, and you run up against an immediate contradiction that should cause you to think about your interpretation of this verse. So, for instance. Suppose you and I are arguing about basketball. I say MJ is better than LeBron. You say, no, you're an idiot. LeBron is better than MJ. I lose my cool. I get angry and I punch you in the face. That's evil. What does it have to do with the love of money in the conventional sense? It, it just doesn't seem to make sense. So we need to look deeper and ask ourselves what actually is being said here. Money, the word for money there, it didn't mean the dollar bill. It didn't mean the yen. It didn't mean Bitcoin or any of these things. The love of money was talking about the prioritization of the seen over the unseen, the exaltation of things over people, the material over the spiritual. And if you understand it that way, there isn't a single example of evil you will find that is not easily explained by that fact. The prioritization of the seen over the unseen really is the root of all evil. The exaltation of things over people really is the root of all evil. You know, so it's not it's not saying that every time evil happens, it's because someone's trying to make an extra dollar at any cost. It's saying that whenever something evil happens, the visible is being made a greater priority over the invisible. The things that are eternal are being made subservient to the things that are temporal. And that opens us up to a much broader understanding that can protect us from these self-defeating anti-biblical ideas that every person's financial condition, no matter how bad it is, no matter how many terrible decisions they made to get there, is something that we should just be content with because God wants us to just accept wherever we are financially without asking any tough questions about how we got there in the first place. Yeah. And I mean, there's there's all kinds of, way, of directions that to go. I'm going to stay on the course. This is a, <laughs> a you know, a, this is potentially you know this is a very broad topic. But there is yeah. a distinction between high value man and a high value woman, and there's a lot of, I think, animus. <laughs> there's a lot of like, um, um, you know, controversy. You know, in that in, in that area because based on uh, the 
based on the market, if you will, the relationship market, um, women are valued for different things than men are if we consider the common and traditional roles. All right. So, for instance, men don't usually, uh, they, they don't really care how much money a woman makes. Okay. So she could be six figures. She could be seven figures. And the guy is like, you know, that doesn't matter if she, is she, you know, is she attractive? Is she fit? You know, is she submissive? Is she, you know, cooperative? You know, those are, th are, are, are things that are much more important as far as being a high value woman. I did an interview with Jessica X on my channel, uh, on my, in my interview series, Conversations with Dr. Thunder. And that was a topic that we discussed, the difference between a high value man and a high value woman. Now, that's not to say that a woman that earns uh, a substantial amount is of no value, but it's but it is not one of the prerequisites for a woman in this context to be considered high value. So there's a lot of there's a lot of contention there because in our mm. modern society we want to we want to say that everything's the same what a man can do a woman can do you know and there's not really any difference you, you know everything else is just a social construct and all like this and of course you know according to uh several studies one in particular that Jordan Peterson references frequently is that actually uh the uh, you know, the information is in the, the, the research has been done and it actually shows that men and women, even given the most egalitarian, you know, uh, policies in a society will tend to double down on what their natural tendencies are. They're not going to, they're not going to do what we think. I mean, uh, what is it in the, uh, what is it in the Netherlands or something? Uh, when they're very egalitarian, you find that uh, men, they even doubled down on what their natural tendencies are, which is to prioritize careers that focus on things. And women, they doubled down, and that was to prioritize on careers that focused on people. That's just, that's just what it is. Um, and we know we, that we clearly, those different kinds of careers tend to pay different. So, yeah. We clearly size each other up differently, right? Right. The, the, clearly. The things, the things that you value yourself for can be very different than the things that other people value you for. And gender relations are no exception, right? So as, as a man, you could be like, hey, I feel, I feel like I'm a great man because of this or that. That doesn't mean that's the way a woman is sizing you up. And, and, no. and vice versa. And, and I don't think these ideas are about leading with what other people want from you and then trying to figure out how you can accommodate that in some kind of spineless way. It's more about saying, hey, I'm going to lead with conviction, but I'm not going to be naive about the way this outer world affects me, the way that this world is always mm -hmm. sizing me up. Yeah, you know, yep. th this whole this whole faith or Christianity versus the manosphere thing, it's it's just such an interesting topic. I mean, I, I like to have more conversation on it in the future, but it it seems that there are a lot of how do I put it? Okay, I make this as an in internal critique as a believer. I feel that that there is a certain defensiveness of sorts that causes believers to listen to anything positive and healthy that is being said in non-faith communities as it as if as if it's some sort of mutually exclusive comparison with Jesus Christ right so if if for instance you have people in the manosphere talking about handling your finances and leveling up in that area of your life we're just really quick to say hey you can do all of that that you want but if you don't have Jesus it don't matter 
you know, or if somebody's talking about health, we can say, hey, you can be as healthy as you want. But if you don't, if, if you ain't got Jesus, it doesn't matter. And I feel like that's a little bit tone deaf. And it's part of the thinking that is causing us to overlook why some people are rejecting the way we talk about Jesus as something that doesn't have anything to offer the challenges of life. For so long, we've talked about, hey, all you need is Jesus, the person of Jesus, right? And, and we don't really flesh out what that means. But then people go to these jobs that they hate. People have to deal with employers and coworkers and customers that talk to them like crap. They they have terrible mess marriages. Their friends bully them. They they're arguing with their family all the time. They're miserable in every area of life, and no one's showing them principles of life that can help them cope with or conquer the things in their life that they truly do have the power to cope with or conquer. And because we're only talking about Jesus in this one dimensional way, as if all he wants from you is for you to tell him that you love him, but not experience his power as something that can transform every area of your life. When, 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 when people go into other spaces and talk about valuable things, it, it's sort of like we're, we're, we're unwilling to acknowledge that. And I, and, I, and I think that's behind some of the defensiveness. That's not to say that, that I offer a blanket um, acceptance for everything that's coming out of circles where maybe like high value is, is being talked about. But like that concept of being a high value man, at least the things that you shared, that's just something that is useful for people to know. I, I've always thought about that in terms of the economic ontological distinction I clarified earlier, but I, I just don't get what's wrong with that. I don't get why that would be so controversial. Yeah, I mean, you 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 know that I'm I'm orthodox, and I think the orthodox perspective on these things is less is less black and white. I think there's more space for gray. Um, and one of the ways that you know truth, um, and things that are beautiful, things that are good. Uh, gets characterized is all things that are beautiful, all things that are good, all things that are true are God's things. They're all, yeah. so <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a definition and there's parameters for what is considered to be the church, but that is not in exclusion of, of other ideas it's just saying these are our ideas this is what we know to be the case if things have not been specifically stipulated it's fair game so so um yeah so obviously there's a lot of space there there's a lot been a lot of developments in technology and the way that we relate to each other and um you know social media and i mean there's a there's a billion things that are not stipulated. So why cut yourself off from all of that? It doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense because the Bible, uh, the Bible does not address a lot of stuff. It addresses a lot of things. It, it addresses, um, maybe the most important things it, it, it addresses at least in a general sense, but there's a lot of things that it does not address. And so I think just ruling stuff out because it, you know, wasn't in the Bible or because your pastor didn't, you know, it wasn't from a, you know, one of your pastor's books, you know, <laughs> or something that, that, you know, I think that's very limiting. Uh, and also makes us. But the notion of being a good steward is in the Bible, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why, and that's why I start out by saying that, you know, though the high value is not an exclusive Christian concept, it certainly is compatible with and congruent with the principles set forth at, in the Bible. It certainly is Christian. <laughs> They're not going to like me for saying that. <laughs> They're not going to like you for that. Well, Hey man, um, to, to me, th this, this sounds like, um, a relatively uncontroversial idea 
if there's anyone out there that feels like, oh, no, 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 you can't afford to talk about this, reach out to us. Let us know. We'll have you on and we'll be happy to discuss with you. Thunder, the last question I want to I want to spend a few minutes on is how do you increase your value? As 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 people that are watching right now, they say, hey, look, the things you talked about on your list on becoming a higher value man, like what are some things I can do to step into that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a few ideas, but I also want to say that um, there's a lot of resources, um, but in particular, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of resources in the in the manosphere in particular. There's a lot of content on, um, you know, investing, on getting yourself in shape, on, you know, um, you know, stop simping. That's that's one of the ways that you can increase your your value. Stop subduing who you are as a person um, and um, sort of pedal, pedestalizing women in particular and just accepting any kind of treatment. You know, that's that's a way that you can increase your value. But uh, I'm about to start a new series on my channel called Leveling Up with Dr. Thunder. And I'm going to get into a lot of the granular stuff, you know, stuff about being organized, being disciplined, um, you know, uh, setting up a schedule, learning how to set up a schedule, <laughs> you know, using technology to assist uh, in the sort of uh, crossing off, you know, of the to-do list. You know, there's a lot, there's, uh, a lot of advancements that we have now that uh, can really help you to, to get that stuff together, uh, realizing that though you may not be motivated to do something, uh, you still have to, you still may have to do it. You have to push through, you know, uh, developing that sort of backbone and intestinal fortitude, um, you know, uh, honoring your commitments, you know, all of these kinds of things, all these principles, um, establishing networks, understanding how to, how to, uh, utilize other people, um, not, not, you know, sort of being an island unto yourself, um, uh, but, you know, being willing to, you know, provide opportunities for others, you know, to collaborate with you. And then obviously what you're going to gain, gain from that. Um, and all of this stuff is, you know, some, some of it is probably stuff that you may have heard before, but in this context, you know, there's a particular goal we have in mind. Uh, and that is, you know, we're after becoming a high value man. If that is a, a goal that you have, then there are specific steps that you can take uh, to level up, to you know, increase your value. Now, will you necessarily become a high value man? No, everyone is not going to be a high value man because by definition, high value men are, I mean, we're using the term high. So it's in relationship to something else. And it speaks to a sort of scarcity of that, you know, uh, folks that achieve that, that level. Um, but you certainly can increase your value. High value man. That's the discussion, not high value person. I've taken notice of that. You, you, you rarely see any podcasts right now on high value person. It's high value, man. Why is this a conversation that's happening uniquely in masculine spaces? Well, I think a lot of um, a lot of men have felt okay. So we have this we have this sort of ever shrinking Overton window. So there's a smaller and smaller amount of stuff that you're allowed to speak your mind on, right? There's, uh, you know, you need to sort of keep the orthodoxy, be PC, you know, uh, it used to be that the barbershop was sort of more, there were a lot more standalone barbershops. So you could kind of just have whatever conversations you were going to have in those barbershops because it was all guys. People understood if you're having an issue in a relationship or if you just wanted to talk politics or whatever it was, you could disagree, you know, but you could have these conversations and they could be edgy kind of conversations. There's not a lot of places to have those conversations and to get certain kinds of information anymore. Um, uh, now it's like the barbershop is connected to a beauty salon. 
So even if you wanted to have, <laughs> you know, certain kinds of edgy conversations that, that dealt with exclusive to man kind of issues, it's not going to be as, you know, there's not as many opportunities to do that without the fear of saying something that gets you canceled or, you know, um, or causes, you know, it causes issues for, for you, you know. Um, so um, I think the, the reason why the online community, you know, certain spaces, Manosphere in particular, um, that a lot of this kind of conversation is happening is it's, it's one of the only places left where you can have frank conversations. Um, and uh, in particular on YouTube, um, YouTube said that they were going to invest what was like $100 million in, in black content. And so they, they decided that they were going to sort of keep their hands off and, and, and not be sort of uh, as stringent and strict about what can be discussed. And so uh, there's a lot of, there's a variety of conversations that are happening um, that are not, you know, like I said, they're not uh, within the Overton window. You know, they're, you know, edgy conversations. They're real conversations. And high value man is one of those, those conversations and one of those topics um, because it's not the kind of conversation that is really an acceptable conversation, uh, like I said, within the Overton window. Because as you said, I said high value man. I didn't say high value person. Now, there are discussions about what is a high value woman, but it's not the same as what a high value man is. Um, that's another reason why um, there's only certain communities that are really with, uh, with regularity having this kind of conversation. But I think it's a critically important conversation. It's a critically important conversation, and we should be having this conversation. Um, if, we're, if we're going to sort of monkey around with certain roles that uh, men and women have had over centuries, and there's biology and there's evolution there's, uh, you know, that's, that's built into the reason that those roles were that way. If you're going to, if you're going to sort of monkey around with that, then, uh, it's gotta be okay to have conversations, um, uh, about, you know, how, how we're going to proceed, how are we going to adjust, how we're going to, um, to deal with, uh, the actual, uh, you know, market so to speak. Uh, and I'm, I'm not using the sexual market value <laughs> terminology sort of on, on purpose, but there is a, a dating market and what it is expected for, uh, especially men to bring to the table is still a traditional value. It's still what these, the, these things, but in, in terms of what women are bringing to the, to the table, it is different than it, what it was. And so we have to talk about how we can, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, how we can still have healthy relationships, how we can, you know, and, and so that's part of what the high value, uh, the whole high value conversation, um, that's part, that's part of that conversation. One of my favorite quotes by C.S. Lewis is he says, good philosophy must exist if for no other reason than that bad philosophy does. We live at a time where there are many discussions on toxic masculinity. What's wrong with our men? What needs to change about our men? And to speak of something as being toxic is to say that it has been contaminated, to say that it has been corrupted, and if we're going to have discussions about toxic masculinity or toxic anything for that matter, then we should be more than happy to have discussions about positive masculinity, purposeful Facts. masculinity, powerful Facts. masculinity. And so um, I'm excited to see there being so many discussions on that. If you are someone who says, hey, I think the world is just fine as it is, there is no toxic masculinity. Well, then I see how this stuff would all entirely bore you. But if you're someone that says, hey, I'm concerned about the well-being of our man. I'm concerned about the mental health of our man. I'm concerned about the direction in which our young brothers are going in. Um, 
then we need to be having conversations about what it means to be a man of valor and value, what it means to be a man of power and purpose. Thunder, we're out of time. I appreciate you breaking this down and talking with me about it today. Um, I'm looking forward to the next round, my brother. Yeah, man. It's always, it's always a joy, man. Yeah, always, man. For those listening, don't forget to click like, hit the subscribe button. Be sure to leave a question or a comment let us, letting us know how you feel, what you think, what you'd like to hear us talk about in the future. And please don't hesitate to share with a family member, friend, or anybody that you think will benefit from listening. And if you think there's somebody interesting we should be talking to, let us know. Make the introduction. We'll be happy to wrap with them. All right, y'all. Take care. Until next time. Peace.